Hey, sorry. My name is Daniel Moore. I, I help manage the travel company Distant Horizon. <clears throat> uh, we organize scholar company journeys to, to all parts of Asia, um, uh, the Middle East and, and North Africa. Uh, we've been working with the University of Oxford Cambridge alumni for uh, probably nearly 20 years now. And in that time, we've organized nearly 300 visits uh, for the alumni uh, to, to various parts of the world. Uh, just before we come on to the main part of the talk, a magnificent mosaics, uh, just a couple of uh, Zoom tips, if I may. Um, uh, if it's uh, if you can or if, if you have any questions, please put that in your chat box, uh, and I will try and take questions, and then we'll answer. We'll we'll, we'll put those to Nirvana at the end of the lecture. Uh, just before we get on to the lecture, if I may, just go through a few of the trips that Cambridge University are planning for uh, 2023. We have a journey to Central Asia, to the, the fabled cities of Bukhara, Samarkand, uh, and Kiva, and that will be led and accompanied by Professor Charles Melville. Uh, then later on in the year, in September, we have a, a lovely walking trip uh, through some of the fabulous walking uh, uh, routes of the Malfi Coast, and that will be accompanied by Dr. Alex Collar, who's accompanied various uh, trips for, for the alumni uh, over the years. In fact, he, he recently came back from a trip to Georgia. Uh, again, about the same month, we have a, a, a journey to Japan uh, that will take in the main sort of cultural uh, site of, of Japan's main island, Honshu Island, uh, and then also uh, with Zara Fleming, uh, some walks, uh, some walks and, and visits to two major festivals in Bhutan uh, in September, October of next year. And, and also uh, accompanied by Nirvana Ramel, who's today's speaker, a, a journey through Croatia and Serbia, Izmi Swiss. Um, there, one will be looking at two millennia of, of history uh, in, in, in that part of the Western Balkans, a fascinating part of the world where sort of Northern Europe meets Southern Europe, where Christianity meets uh, the Islamic world. So uh, without further ado, if I may hand over to Nirvana, uh, she will then uh, carry on with, with the talk. Thanks. Hi, um, hello, thank you for sharing your time with me today. Um, as Daniel mentioned, oh, didn't, um, I am Croatian by birth um, and I have a, a fond childhood memories of uh, family travels with my grandpa um, through some of these areas and looking at these mosaics that I will be showing today. Um, later on, um, of course, there was a joy of discovery on the academic level when the, I learned about them at the university. But because I studied in socialist Yugoslavia, the intricate political and religious historical background of these mosaics, uh, more far more complex than just a simple battle between the Byzantines and Ostrogoths, uh, was not really discussed. Um, Actually, religion was not forbidden in Yugoslavia, but certainly it was not spoken about. And then uh, another thing that was particular to our studies in general, it was that we didn't really discuss schisms and divisions, uh, uh, which really define this crossroads of the Balkans that really, it, it, you know, the no northern um, Adriatic is, is a border of it. Um, and these schisms and divisions over millennia uh, mill uh, mark so many cultural monuments in the Balkans and, uh, um, and this area as well. So um, we didn't discuss any divisions in our wonderful Yugoslav utopia and uh, we just believed in this brotherhood and unity. So today I would like to share with you the little bit I have learned about these, his, uh, these, these mosaics and their historical background since I've started organizing study tours to the area with the distant horizons. And um, I can proudly say that uh, mine were among the first English speaking tours in Aquilea when I went to research uh, the itinerary nearly a decade ago, the, the locals told me that they last saw Brits in the Second World War. I think they're seeing more of them these days uh, from the cruise ships that are docking in Trieste. So there's a second coming. Um, so what I would like to attempt to do is place these mosaics in a conversation with each other. So go beyond uh, the, what is it? You know, is it a peacock? Is it a stag? And what, what is the symbolism of this? And tackle the historical reasons why they were made. 
And um, let's start just with the uh, Google map uh, so that you can place them um, in geographic relation to each other. I will share a screen with you. There are three UNESCO World Heritage Sites uh, in the area of uh, Northern Adriatic, which have earned that status with their exceptionally well preserved uh, architecture and mosaics in particular. Ravenna down here um, is a famous one. Um, most people have heard about Ravenna and hopefully visited. Aquileia is starting to get busier in the past few years with busloads of tourists uh, coming from cruise ships docking in Trieste. Uh, Porridge here in Croatia, um, it, it has a regular stream of visitors thanks to the city's reputation as a nice tourist resort, but I'm not sure how many people that visit the site actually understand how rare and historically important these mosaics are. There are, or there were, other mosaics relating to these sites, partially preserved ones in Grado, uh, here near Aquileia, um, and uh, we also know that the bishop uh, um, Maximianus of Ravenna built another glorious basilica in Pula, uh, but very little of it uh, remains today, no mosaics, uh, thanks to the Venetian policy of reusing cultural monuments on the Croatian coast as the source of building material for grand projects in Venice. So you can find uh, bits of that basilica in the Marciana Library on, and San Marco Church, and you can find bits of Diocletian's palace from Split in the um, Santa Maria de la Salute at the beginning of the Grand Canal, but okay, that's that's for another day. Uh, so today this is really a dialogue between Porridge and Ravenna uh, that I want to highlight, but um, they do stand in the long shadow of Aquileia, which cannot possibly be sidelined. So the oldest mosaics uh, in this conversation are uh, from Aquileia. Uh, they're dating to the first half of the fourth century. Today, Aquileia is a sleepy small town surrounded by marshlands uh, with a population of around three and a half thousand people. But once upon a time, uh, Aquileia was second only to Rome during the Roman Empire. And afterwards, as a patriarch, it remained one of the most powerful political, um, religious, and economic entities in the West um, until the Venetian Republic subdued it in the 15th century. Its geographical position meant that it was on the crossroads of all the main trading routes in the Roman Empire. Uh, there was a wide river that used to run through it uh, and then into Adriatic uh, Sea, which made it an ideal spot for a large commercial Port. Today you can't see that because there's only a little stream that remains, uh, the, the flow of the river was shifted with earthquakes and the waterways silted over the centuries. But in the second century uh, AD, Aquileia was one of the biggest cities of the ancient world uh, with a population of approximately 100,000 people. It was an imperial city, um, the emperor maintained its residence there, um, and uh, then it was a capital of the province of Venezia and Histria, uh, which, most importantly, controlled the passages through the Alps, uh, which were the only connecting trading corridors between the Germanic Europe in the north and uh, Italy in the south, uh, and then also uh, the only corridors between the Balkans in the east and the Italian peninsula. So Aquileia collected duty on any goods that were traded uh, in or from those areas. So these were the most profitable uh, borders in Europe. By the time we get to the early Christian period, Aquileia's wealthy households um, and public buildings were already full of mosaics and their function was traditionally Roman just to, to advertise the owner's prosperity and learning or, or straightforward generation of emperors uh, and Roman mythology in the public uh, places. Uh, but when Christianity became legal with the edict of uh, Milan, Aquileia instantly became a bishopric and an important religious center, uh, drawing its multi-ethnic, multicultural population to this new religion. The first basilica was constructed the same year, uh, 313, uh, but uh, what you see when you go there today, which is what this picture is showing, um, it's, it's extensions and rebuilds uh, uh, in several times uh, since. So to, what you see today is an amalgamation of building materials and styles 
as well as human perseverance, I guess. Uh, but what you encounter first as you enter the basilica is the original floor. And it's the largest Christian mosaic in the Western world. Approximately 700 square meters uh, have been revealed and excavations are still ongoing. There are many Roman motifs in it, but uh, they are there with a completely new iconology, completely new interpretation. So what we're looking at, uh, it's the main nave of today's basilica of Santa Maria Assunta, but originally this was the hall where the neophytes were taught uh, the new religion. And the mosaics served as a illustration of basic Christian principles, sort of a, a Sunday school in Tessere. Um, so this classroom floor uh, is divided in four irregular zones. Some of them are then subdivided and, and the whole floor really looks as if it's covered wall to wall with different precious carpets, the meaning of which moved the neophyte visitor towards higher knowledge. So first, as you enter, uh, but also sprinkled all over this great floor. Uh, there are lots of knots of Solomon, uh, which symbolize the unity between God and man and also the eternal life. And uh, most of them seem to be made uh, with tessera in three colors with a black outline. So they might also be referencing the Holy Trinity. Uh, but what is interesting about them is that they part they, they depart from the usual Roman literal realism ornamental and uh, here in relatively abstract visual language they, they express these complex ideas of eternity of divinity and so on. Now this uh, lower image is an iconic one which you will find on fridge magnets and uh, uh, kitchen cloths and all souvenirs in Aquileia, and it's the standoff between the tortoise and the cockerel. The Greek name Tartarukos uh, means inhabitant of Tartarus, so the poor tortoise was considered a symbol of backwardness um, and, and also because of its slowness as well. Um, and, and it's also a symbol of sin uh, because it, it stubbornly adhered to the old pagan ways. Cockerel, on the other hand, announces the light made by God, of course, and it's a symbol of uh, St. Peter's as well. Now, when you move on from this, uh, Jesus appears in the second zone in the form of a good shepherd of all God's creatures, not just the chosen ones. One of the attractions of Christianity was that it appeared very inclusive and democratic in comparison to other religions. So the good shepherd here, he has his sheep and he's holding a carding rake, uh, but he's also welcoming all these wild animals that surround him, stags, storks, dolphins, and so on. Each one of them has its own symbolism. So a pheasant stands for um, beauty and immortality of the soul. Um, storks killing the snake might be removal of sin. Dolphins are with followers of Jesus, but there are usually several interpretations for each animal. Um, and I need to leave that for some other time um, and move. Um, onwards and onwards we have the panels uh, showing Christians bringing gifts. So this youngster has speared fish and he's got a small basket of bread rolls like the boy who brought the uh, bread and fish to Jesus with which he fed many in the Gospel of St. John. And then uh, we have a woman um, uh, who is bringing or possibly releasing a bird. The birds are usually a symbol of soul but also of peace between God and man in early Christianity. Then uh, we have one bringing grapes, um, of course, the symbolic of the wine that is offered um, during the Eucharist as a part of the Eucharist. And then uh, we have a man bringing the other symbol of the Eucharist, a basket of bread. And all of them are greeted by the winged uh, victory that is offering them a crown of uh, laurel leaves and the palm branch. Um, and she would have done that in the ancient athletic contest, but here uh, um, the image is referencing the uh, first Corinthians where Christians are mentioned as those who have run the case and received the prize, which is of course the Eucharist. Here you could 
see it symbolized by this uh, a great basket of bread rolls and a chalice that's been damaged um, with uh, with wine. So this whole section um, around the altar gives instruction on how to participate in the Eucharistic liturgy because in the early Christianity people would uh, form a procession to the altar bearing gifts of various food which they brought to share and also receive the Eucharist in return. And then finally, after this zone, there is this fabulous fishing party and the story of uh, Jonah and this last zone uh, without any divisions. Uh, almost the entire area is the sea. It's full of exciting sea fauna, not too dissimilar from the earlier Roman mosaics, but of course the iconography is different, uh, even though the visual continuity might be obvious. Um, except for the first boat that you see here on the left, which is part of the Jonah story, um, you see angels uh, in charge of all other boats, um, and they're very engaged in trying to catch as many fish as possible, fish symbolizing the souls. So some are standing on the rocks like this one and fishing with a fishing rod, the other ones are pulling the uh, the nets. Um, so the angels are really hard at work here. And then um, around this, there are these uh, uh, separate episodes of Jonah's story. Uh, we see him first devoured by a rather strange looking whale. Uh, and then he's vomited up here onto the dry land. And finally, um, having found God, he's at peace and he's enjoying life, uh, having a siesta under the pergola of cucumbers, um, which is quite a common in thing in this uh, area. So think about it, this floor must have been one of the most exciting things the poor of Aquileia had access to in all their lives. Uh, it conveyed the stories of resurrection, forgiveness, eternal life. Um, it was aesthetically pleasing, exciting. Um, and it, it, it must have spread the, the word about them also must have spread across across the Christendom. They would have been rather famous considering just sheer size of them and overall the importance of Aquileia. Now, as I mentioned, they are not in direct conversation with the later ones in Ravenna and Porridge, um, but they do with their size and opulence illustrate this importance of Aquileia in the Christian world and, and perhaps help to explain the sway with which Aquilean patriarchs uh, um, kind of ruled and, and they held in Christianity for another millennium, uh, especially in the duel, as we'll see later on, uh, the duel of mosaics between Ravenna and Porridge. Now, let's move to Ravenna, which was also an important uh, port in Roman times, uh, but about half the size of Aquileia. And that fact in itself gives you an indication of Aquileia's importance. Um, Aquila did prove very difficult to defend once the trouble started, uh, but uh, Ravenna became the capital of the Western Roman Empire in 402 because the Romans thought that it would be easier to defend it against the Goths due to its position in the middle of the swampy estuaries. But the Goths, of course, passed by simply um, and first conquered Rome in, in 410 and then turned back and took uh, Ravenna in 476, and they made it the capital of the Ostrogothic kingdom. Now, they admired Roman civilization in the same way the Romans admired the ancient Greeks. They sought to emulate it, and, and they built as many palaces and churches um, as they could. Um, they were uh, Christians as well by that point, uh, but of a different persuasion. They were Arians, uh, and they did not follow the Byzantine and Roman orthodoxy. Now, I'm using the term orthodox in its original meaning, early Christian meaning, when it simply means the sound doctrine um, in ancient Greeks. So in those early times, it stood for the official, officially a church, official church and accepted dogma rather than what we think of it today, you know, Catholics, Orthodox schisms and so on. The Byzantines, reconquered Ravenna 64 years later in 740. Um, and then uh, it was uh, uh, for two centuries, it was the seat of the westernmost Byzantine province. Now, the issue here 
was uh, we, which shows through mosaics is not just a mere temporal power uh, who's the king i'm the king or you're the king uh, but the doctrinal battles that divided early christians and continuously challenged the church and papacy as institutions and their relationship with the secular powers in a way what we have in ravenna and Porridge are visual manifestations of these disagreements in this as i keep mentioning a battle of mosaics. The key issues uh, were the nature of Christ. Was he born both divine and human or just human and then became divine? Um, also, how exactly did the Holy Trinity work as one and three at the same time? Uh, was Mary mother of Jesus or mother of God and, and so on. It was important for the emperor to have the support of the church, but that support could couldn't really carry much weight if the church itself was not strong and united. So the <clears throat> empire pushed the church. Um, it, it helped organize these great councils uh, which were held and, and where the church leaders tried to reach consensus on these various issues and put an official version of the Bible together and come up with a unified uh, um, dogma but they never really managed to reach full consensus uh, they just created many more schisms some of which still echo today and some of which are long forgotten to understand uh, mosaics of ravenna and porridge one needs to be aware of two schisms in particular the first one between the arians and the uh, orthodoxy which started already with the first council in uh, nicaea in 325 um, and then manifested itself now in the mosaics I'll be showing you 200 years later. And then secondly, of the so-called schism of the three chapters between the Byzantine emperor and the Pope on one side and the Chalcedonian Christianity of Northern Italy and Istria under the leadership of the Patriarchate of Aquileia. And this lasted for a good century and a half, and uh, we'll talk about it when I get to uh, Porridge, uh, mosaic and influenced uh, all sorts of religious art. So let's start with the simplest schism between the established church, the Orthodoxy, and the Ostrogoth Arians in Ravenna. Ravenna mosaics overall span about 120 years, and they have three distinct periods. There's a late Roman, then there's a early Christian, there's an Ostrogoth, and then a Byzantine period. <coughs> the baptistry of the Bishop Neon is one of the oldest buildings um, with preserved uh, mosaics, um, and it was built while Ravenna was the capital of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, the mosaics still use a Roman visual language. Um, th there's an opulence, there's a realism, there's a portrait value, there's a movement, flair, um, many colors. Um, in the middle here, in the center of all of it, uh, we can see St. John Baptist, uh, uh, baptizing Jesus in the River Jordan. And the River Jordan is personified here um, by the old man offering a green cow kindly to um, Christ. And uh, they are encircled by the procession of apostles. Uh, all of them are named. They, they have their, title, their, their names written next to them, very much a, a Roman tradition. Um, and really cut out of this um, picture is um, it's sort of elaborate floral decorations and they symbolize Garden of Eden and these empty thrones and altars which are referencing uh, both the majesty and divinity of Christ. But when the Ostrogoths took over in 476, they didn't want to use Neonian baptistry, uh, Orthodox, they built their own Arian baptistry. Now, um, Arians at that point um, were considered heretics uh, in the eyes of the established church. Um, and uh, they were they were actually named after a Libyan priest, uh, Arius, who died in 336. Uh, but his uh, students, uh, his followers, went and uh, 
spread Christianity amongst the gods. So that's how the gods became Arians. Arians did not believe in Holy Trinity. For them, Jesus was subordinate to his father and they did not believe in Jesus's dual divine and human nature. According to them, he was born human and only became divine after resurrection. Uh, Mary didn't feature at all. She was simply a human vessel God has chosen for his own purposes and, and, and so on. Um, there are many uh, disagreements there, dogmatic disagreements. Initially, they practiced their version of Christianity freely, but after the Nicene Creed was declared, uh, which most Christians follow today, um, the, 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 they were declared, as I mentioned, heretics. Um, but, you know, here they got their own kingdom, so they could do, build and decorate and worship as they pleased. So they built a baptistry. Um, they clearly modeled it on the Neonian one that we just saw. Um, the architecture is almost the same, um, but uh, the, the mosaic is much more simplified. Everything is there, but it is clearer in a kind of less is more kind of uh, way, but also with the subtle dogmatic references, which may be lost to our modern eye. Um, they, they, it, it's interesting that, that they are getting away from all of that Roman realism movement, volume, shadows, and so on. Um, and, and they're using what we think of as Byzantine style, um, even though they are you know, opponents of, of Byzantium. And, and they, their envoys would have spent a lot of time in Constantinople in court there negotiating peace treaties and so on. So they would have brought this fashion back to Ravenna. And as I said, you know, they did admire uh, what in those times were Romans, uh, whether, regardless whether they were Byzantines or not. Um, so they decided to use this, this new language, this new visual language, but as I said, with, with their own iconography. And we can really see it when we put them next to each other. Uh, so these are the central scenes of baptism in these two domes. Um, so, as I mentioned, the Arians did not believe in the divine nature of Christ prior to his resurrection, and they really wanted, with their imagery, to stress this humanness, um, if you like, uh, of, of Jesus. So, they often portray them as, as a beardless adolescent, rather than a, a fully grown-up man with a beard and muscle definition, which is how he appears in the standardized church version. So you have man Jesus in the Orthodox ones, and you have kind of a bit of podgy teenager in the Aryan version. Um, the Orthodox um, uh, Christ uh, is, is baptized uh, with the water from River Jordan. But uh, on the left with the Arian Christ, he is baptized with the water from River Jordan. And then also the Holy Spirit is bringing the water of, uh, uh, of Genesis, thus bringing him the spirit that uh, uh, he, uh, as a mere mortal at this point, is lacking. As I said, they did not believe in his divine uh, nature. Uh, the Orthodox Christ, the one on the right, is also facing west. It was believed that he was crucified uh, facing west and that true followers of God must first renounce evil and darkness by turning west and then turn towards the light in the east. Arians didn't believe in that, so they simply had Jesus facing east towards uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem. So um, here we find these, these different dogmas showing themselves and different styles influenced by the latest and greatest fashions coming from uh, Constantinople. Um, we could probably admire far more of, of these examples uh, of, of differentiated dogma, but Byzantines destroyed um, most of the Aryan decorations, so um, or covered them up. So we have very little. The Aryan baptistry was whitewashed at some point, and, and that's how uh, mosaics were saved and uh, only discovered during the Allied bombing uh, in the Second World War. Now, when Byzantines took over in Ravenna, the period of building uh, that started with the Ostrogoths continued more or less uninterrupted, but of course with a new program, trying to really send a strong message to the remaining Aryan population. And one such strong message is in the apse uh, mosaic of the Basilica uh, of Santa Polinere Classe. 
which is in quite a complex visual metaphor of uh, transfiguration and uh, also the Eucharist. Arians did not believe in transfiguration nor in transubstantiation uh, because for them Jesus was just a man until his resurrection and the Eucharist was more or less bloodless sacrifice which they offered to God. Uh, so this mosaic tries to tell them a different story. Transfiguration is described in the Gospels and it is shown here. We have two figures set in the sky and they're actually labeled um, as, as Moses and Elijah uh, who appeared during uh, during the um, transfiguration to Christ. Um, also, uh, the Bible says that uh, um, there were three apostles there in the Mount Tabor with Christ, uh, Peter, James, and John, and they are symbolized by these three sheep here. One, two, and three. And the Gospel of Matthew also mentions the bright cloud and the voice of the Father and the hand of God here is appearing um, and through the clouds and symbolizes this. But this mosaic, it's not so straightforward. It's not just that, because if it were straightforward, you would have a, something that symbolizes also Mount Tabor, so that it's showing you, it's sort of putting you in a time and place. So what it is, is really a complex visual allegory that links the transfiguration with the Holy Liturgy, <coughs> Eucharist, um, and the Lord's second coming. Most of that meaning is summed up in this beautiful medallion in this cross. Transfiguration is understood as anticipation of resurrection and second coming, both Christ and our own, um, which cannot happen without his uh, Jesus' sacrifice uh, on the cross. So here we have Alpha and Omega, the, be the beginning and the end. Um, ichtus, uh, the word ichtus, uh, Greek uh, acronym for uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Son of God, Savior, or meaning fish, that's why the fish became a symbol of Christianity. And then be below here we have Salus Mundi, salvation of the world. So the Alpha is transfiguration, and the Omega is the second coming, and that is achieved through crucifixion. The Bible tells us that a sign from God will appear in the sky and church fathers believe that the, that sign will be a, a, a cross. So this particular cross um, is both the sign of the Jesus of sacrifice, we have a medallion showing Christ's face here, um, and also a sign that is announcing this judgment day. So seemingly simple, but absolutely packed with meaning. Uh, <clears throat> It could also be that the stylized abstract visual language indicates kairos, um, which is a divine time in which past, present, and future coexist together in Christ. So this apps depicts not, as I mentioned, not just that historical event of transfiguration set in time and place, but it is kind of a symbol of that transfiguration, which is relating to the present when you as a believer, um, you are in the church and you're receiving the body and blood of Christ through Eucharist, and then also is announcing that future, the kingdom that is to come. So it is the three things at once, the transfiguration, the Eucharistic liturgy, and the second coming. So anybody who ever thought of this as a few bushes and sheep and uh, and the uh, saint praying, oh, so this is quite quite a quite a complex one. Now below all of this is the figure of Saint Apollinaire, uh, who was the saint who brought Christianity to this area, um, and and he is most likely representing not just himself but the whole church and he's summoning up the entire flock of faithful which are symbolized by these 12 orderly lined up sheep uh, as the original flock of Jesus's apostle came to Jesus. Uh, they, they are there to celebrate not just this event of transformation but also kind of this union that we can experience with God through Eucharist um, and look forward to this final um, outcome. Um, and 
Of course, they are there to show the Aryans what they are missing. So incredibly um, symbol packed mosaic um, that was was viewed by the people um, at the time um, as, 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 as a very, very complex um, dogmatic message. Another celebration of Eucharistic liturgy is shown in the famous mosaics in the Church of San Vitale uh, in Ravenna on the walls of each uh, side of the main altars circled here with the uh, red. There is no winged victory or local saints here to dispense bread and wine to the faithful um, like we've seen in Aquileia or just now in the San Apollinaire in Classe. The Emperor Justinian himself holds the bread basket, the body of Christ, followed by his entourage of priests, soldiers and courtiers. The mosaic here um, is, is not, it doesn't hold that theological complexity of the class A mosaics. It, it is meant to assert the fact that the earthly rule comprising the church and the emperor um, also has God given dual nature like Christ and that each attends to their own domain, each assists the other in fulfilling the God's purpose in the way. This mosaic was made a decade before Justinian triggered another great schism by condemning officially the writings of three early Christian thinkers. And that is why it's referred to as the schism of three chapters, there are no particular chapters, chapters of writings. The schism wasn't really about the writings, but about the fact that for the first time, a secular ruler dared to interfere in the church dogma. Justinian did try to persuade the Pope to do it, but Pope refused and then he was put under the house arrest for quite a few years um, and eventually agreed to support the Justinian. So here in Ravenna, this hasn't happened yet, but it kind of gives us a taste of, of these things to come because when you look at them, the way their elbows cross over each other and whose feet are in front of whose feet and so on, um, it's difficult to say whether this is a display of, of unity or a symphony of powers or a subtle elbowing and power struggle. On the other wall, um, Justinian's Empress Theodora holds the chalice, uh, the Eucharist, uh, 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 with the Eucharist uh, uh, wine, uh, so that she can join uh, the the procession uh, that her husband is leading. The history has judged. Theodora um, as a wise and capable empress, um, and she's still celebrated as a saint in the Orthodox Church. But in her time, she was mocked because of her somewhat inglorious past. And she was also accused of heresy because she adhered to the Oriental Orthodoxy, which that's yet another schism. It, it split from the official church during the uh, Chalcedonian Council. There are still non Chalcedonian. Uh, Christian Oriental uh, uh, churches, uh, Coptic, Armenian, Ethiopian, among others. Uh, so Justinian edict against these three chapters uh, is often interpreted as an attempt to appease the Oriental churches and bring them under the umbrella of the official church, um, whether for, for to, to help his empress uh, not to be considered heretic by most of the court um, or simply to boost his power as well with a very strong church. But in, in any case, this peacemaking backfired infamously. Uh, not only did the Oriental churches remain disinterested in Chalcedonian creed, uh, but by daring to interfere in the matters of dogma and bully the Pope, Justinian alienated a large number of North Italian and Istrian bishops whose um, spiritual leader then became the patriarch of Aquileia. And one of those angry clergy was Euphrasius, the Bishop of Porich um, on the Istrian peninsula in today's Croatia. Euphrasius was sent, appointed bishop sent to Porich by the Byzantines um, and on his arrival he promptly rebuilt and decorated the 
the, the new basilica because they, it was he found the dilapidated church from earlier centuries in its place. Uh, unfortunately, the wall decoration has not been preserved, uh, but the central apse uh, gives us still a plenty material to ponder on. And we'll focus on this uh, upper part because down down uh, below, uh, which is mostly hidden by this medieval ciborium, which is not from Justinian's uh, time, uh, they're just uh, scenes of annunciation, visitation here on a side, um, and then you have Archangel Gabriel and some um, saints. Uh, so not much is happening there, but uh, we'll, we'll see what is happening uh, up there. Um, in the semi-dome of the apse um, and in the triumphal arch. Now, right on top, uh, we have Jesus Pantocrator, ruler of everything. And uh, he is sitting on the sphere of creation and he's flanked with six apostles on each side. And below him is the triumphal arch with 12 medallions of uh, um, with the busts uh, of, of female martyrs. And then the 13th one just below him um, contains the Lamb of God. In the vault uh, is Mary and Jesus enthroned with uh, some angels on each side and locals um, to Mary's left. Uh, we have an angel and uh, uh, three unnamed saints. Here. Um, and then to Mary's right, we have another angel and then a local patron, Saint Mauro, followed by the Bishop Euphrasius offering his basilica to Mary for blessing and protection. And then his brother Claudius, uh, who was uh, the deacon. Um, and then right here, we even find. Um, the uh, Euphrasius uh, nephew, the little Euphrasius Jr. I mean, a little bit of nepotism never hurt um, anybody. Now, unlike in San Vitale and San Apollinare in Classe, here we see the, the family uh, thing with uh, San Mauro and the angel. Uh, here we find again the old Roman realism revived in the portraits uh, here and the bishop, bishop and, and uh, apostles and, and so on. Um, and Euphrasius actually goes as far as to uh, pay extra for his own face to be made with smaller, finer tesserae, so that when you are in inside the basilica, his face really stands out uh, when you're looking at, at the, the whole assembly up there. That's quite interesting. But uh, what is even more interesting from the social history point of view is not the slightly stylistic uh, regression towards uh, Roman portraiture, uh, but the positioning of the key players in this mosaic. Nobody can deny that Jesus is victorious. He's ruling over everything from the highest point in the triumphal arch, but people don't tend to crook their necks looking all the way up there. They usually focus their gaze on the absidal dome where we find Mary and child enthroned with a hand of Holy Father coming out of these clouds and crowning uh, uh, Mary uh, with a crown that is made both from gold and jewels as well as laurel wreaths. So it's both earthly and heavenly. And <clears throat> sorry, this is arguably the first known representation of Mary in the, iconologically speaking, top spot, if you like. Uh, that's an that's a very technical word. Um, this is the first time that Mary is shown really where only rulers are shown uh, in the Western art. <coughs> Apologies. In Ravenna, similar, but not quite the same, Madonna will appear just a few years later in another church that I'm not showing today, San Apollinare Nuovo. Um, and, and there she's attached, she, she is, as you can see, uh, sort of um, making a sign towards the procession of virgins and three magi that are coming to bow to her. So she's on a side wall and this hand gesture um, 
you know, with two fingers is symbolizing Christ's dual divine and human nature and thus confirms her own status as a mother of God. But to the right, if you look in Porridge, she places her hand on Jesus's shoulder in a very proprietorial manner, sort of like saying he may belong to God and humankind, but he is also hers. She's really holding him with both hands. So if we consider that Mary is often used as an allegory of pers or personification of Mother Church, we can read the seemingly simple mosaic as an act of opposition to both the imperial power and papal weakness. There are no symbols of imperial power in the Euphrasian Basilica. There are no magi, no depictions of emperors or civil servants in unity with the church and God. Mary is the powerful one. Mary is the one on the throne. And the only people near that power are saints and priests of the right persuasion. So what appears to us as a simple enthroned Madonna and child was actually a slap in the face of establishment. A letter written by the Pope and addressed to the governor of Ravenna um, insisted that Bishop Euphrasius should be removed from his seat by force and described him as evil monger and the biggest Aquilean imposter and schismatic. So with this uh, silent rant from a Pope and from Euphrasius, uh, I will conclude this conversation of mosaics. I could go on forever, really. Um, this conversation of the Northern Adriatic mosaics, which moved within these 200 years from classroom conversation to soft politics, from simple narration to complex theological discourse. And all that, if you think about it, with just some broken bits of stone, terracotta, colored glass, and lots of gold. I hope you've enjoyed this explosion of colors and information and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you very much, Devana. That was brilliant. A brilliant introduction, Mosaics. Uh, it really told the history of, 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 of the region. We've had one question and we've got two, a minute to answer it, if you may. Um, I think the question was, what was Jesus holding in his right hand in the Aquileia Mosaic? Uh, you hear that? The, the, the good shepherd, you mean? The, the good shepherd, uh, possibly. Let's go back to that. Uh... We've got a minute because I think it's going to... Yes, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I, I comp No, no, I have... that's okay. Oh, he is holding the, the, the tool uh, to... to um, oh, what is the name of the tool that you use for wool? Oh, uh, shearing. No, no, not the shearing. When you when you when you cut the wool and then you use this like a metal horrible comb brush uh, uh, to to take all the impurities yeah. out of the wool. It okay, is... but I think we've we've got the impression. Anyway, Nirvana, thank you very much for that. That was brilliant. Um, it, it's a shame to bring you to an end because, but they have another lecture, so I think we need to. I move apologize. On. I apologize for my terrible timekeeping, no, no. and I'm happy to answer the questions via email. Please do uh, uh, send them through. I'm I'm happy to carry on this conversation in some other medium. Thank you. Absolutely, P please do. And if anybody is interested in Nirvana's uh, lecture, to uh, you know, then or, or trip, she's doing one to to Croatia and Serbia next year. But but thank you very much for everybody. For, for tuning in and thank you very much to Nirvan as well for, at this time as well. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.